started, a um, couple of announcements. Um, there's no essential change in the, um, in the laboratory outlines, uh, except to um, make a couple of corrections and uh, to indicate that um, Mr. Weaver will have the last um, uh, tasting of California red wines. Um, it's not because I'm lazy uh, at all, because I'll be here, but uh, it's because that um, there's no point in being a TA unless you learn something on how to, to be a TA. That's part of the job of being a TA. Is to, and so my responsibility is to be sure that he does conduct a class and he will be conducting the field trip and also the tasting in the last uh, week of the course. Um, the um, lab reports which I'm giving back uh, at the end of the hour go from 60 to 100. The average is about 84 to 85. I didn't actually run it down. Maybe slightly more than that. There were quite a number of 90s, a lot of 80s, a few 70s and uh, one or just one or two below 70. Um, if you're having difficulty with the the last four labs, of course, you shouldn't have any difficulty with because they're more or less descriptive. But the other um, laboratories, um, I'll be glad to, if you're having any problems with the ones that you still have to hand in, I'll be glad to go over them with you, and so will Mr. Weaver ahead of time. Um, we're not trying to make them hard at all. They're fairly straightforward. Now, the um, lecture material for today is on Italy and on vermouth. Uh, the vermouth material is, uh, as you know, somewhat out of, of place, but we didn't have any other place to put it. Um, we do do sparkling wine production in 124, and uh, so I have agreed to at least do some lecture material on it. We will not have a laboratory on vermouth production for reasons that will become obvious in just a few minutes. And also, I'm cutting down the material on Italy. I've been giving them Italy such a bad time for so many years that um, I thought maybe I'd be good to it this year and not, uh, <laughs> and not uh, give such a long lecture on it. There is a fairly good general discussion with the Davis point of view, uh, pretty well given as to the factors which influence quality in Italy and the Amring Winkler, Amring Singleton um, uh, table, uh, uh, wine introduction. Um, there is a large number of increasing geographical controls. Uh, they're coming out every month. And uh, if you are interested in seeing them, uh, with colored maps and description of the variety in the area, uh, they're in the Winkler Library. The Revista de Viticultura, Enologia. <coughs> This is the one from the Conigliano station in northern Italy. <coughs> and all of the new appellations of origin are being published there for some reason that I don't quite understand. They're all in color, usually in red and white and black. And they, uh, they give some analysis and they give some um, uh, description of the varieties and uh, the methods. The thing that impresses you, <clears throat> first of all, and this is a basic problem with respect to Italy, is the wide range of varieties and the wide range of composition of the wines. I was looking through one just the other day. Uh, the alcohol contents, the approved alcohol contents, run from 8.5 to 13.5. Uh, this is more than any other European uh, district could tolerate, and specifically more than a small district could tolerate. In some regions, there are a great number of varieties, and in hardly any region is there just one variety. There are a few appellations that are just coming out now which say Cabernet of this region or Pinot of that region. In those cases, a specific variety uh, are, um, are given. Uh, the reason for this, I think, is that the practices have never been standardized, and they've never been standardized because Italy is still a nation of small wine producers, literally thousands and thousands of small wine producers. Uh, and uh, for that reason, uh, they cannot specialize. There is no possibility of sending their son to Conigliano. The whole station has, which takes care of a lot of agriculture besides viticulture, 
only has a couple of hundred students in it and a staff of maybe five or six. So that it really doesn't, uh, and, a, and a viticultural area that's seven times as, or five times as big as ours uh, with a very small staff. And this is the main experiment station for the whole of Italy as far as this kind of research is done. So that uh, there's not, uh, of the total Italian industry, uh, I would guess that there is um, um, not enough technicians for perhaps more than 10% of the total industry um, because such a large percentage is made in small amounts and then in turn passed on to large bottling plants or sold in bulk. Very large percentage of Italian wines is still sold in bulk and distributed in bulk. They have some very serious viticultural problems and maybe this is the basis of their entire problem. But the varieties uh, have never been standardized. There, there are very few ampelographies, that is, classifications of Italian wines. Um, one published in the early 1900s, uh, which is perfectly all right, but certainly is not exhaustive treatment. Uh, Professor Almo frequently describes Italy as a, a very heaven of a place to look for um, for um, uh, varieties of grapes because there is so much work that could be done on varieties there. The second problem is overcropping. The whole of the northeastern Italy is on arbors and uh, they just traditionally overcrop. When you plant on arbors it's very hard to prune so forth. Uh, in the middle of Italy you go down roads and you see these grapes hanging from trees from one uh, uh, tree to the next. Also very difficult to prune and therefore very difficult to keep from overcropping. In addition, there is the, the persistent problem of viruses, which the Italians have studied last of the major European countries, the research having really originated here, and then the French have become very expert on it, and finally, and the Portuguese have become very expert on it, and finally, the Italians have taken it up. But you still see large areas with uh, chlorosis of various kinds, a yellow mosaic, and so forth. The mixed planting I've uh, covered in Viticulture 3 at, at great length and I don't need to go into it here. This is partly a result of economic pressures resulting from too many, too large families and the necessity of producing a great deal of food at home so that in a single area you will find grapevines, olives, tomatoes, potatoes, cows, children, horses, mules, some people. Um, very uh, difficult to harvest each crop at exactly the right time, very difficult to uh, have any sort of specialization on how to spray the vines, uh, how to pick out the mosaic vines from the other vines and so forth. And the time of harvest generally tends to become retarded under these circumstances. The more perishable crops like tomatoes uh, being picked first and the grapes being picked later. Uh, then there's this general lack of interest in wine quality, which I've described in bit three, and I don't need to go into it anymore. The Barola, which we had in class, and which the other class last section will be having today, had a bottle lasted of 0.1. Now this is among the most prestigious wines shipped from Italy. Barola, is, as I said, is considered the Burgundy of Italian wines, and uh, it has developed over a period of time some reputation as being one of the more standardized wines, and this is the most prestigious shipper, uh, Barola, the Opera Pia of uh, uh, Barola, and yet they're shipping a wine at $4.59 a bottle with a very perceptible volatile acidity. And uh, I think I just rest my case on the problem with Italian wines uh, on that sort of situation. They really don't care. Uh, to them, uh, wine is something like salt and pepper is on our table. At the, we don't really pay very much attention to the quality of the pepper we have and so forth. It's a condiment. And to them, wine is just another addition to the meal. They're not drinking the wine for itself. That is, any aesthetic or quality pleasure they may get from it. They're just drinking it to wash down the pasta. And uh, under those conditions, it's pretty hard to develop an interest in quality uh, in uh, Italy. There are several reasons why I think this will change. One, the European common market. Uh, which will move wines from one country to the next. Last year, uh, Italy was the largest consumer of French champagne for the first time in history. 
uh, I was, if I was an Italian sh sparkling wine producer, uh, that would put the fear of God in me right away quickly. Because if the, if the French can send their champagnes to Italy and outbeat the Italians with their lower standards of living and lower wage income, uh, there is something wrong with Italian sparkling wines. And I would want to find out as quickly as possible what, what, the, what was wrong with them. I think the problem is just a uh, lack of uh, 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 technological uh, know-how and uh, of uh, the sort of things that are necessary to, um, to make a good wine industry, good grapes and good wine making. Uh, there are a few indications that uh, the situation might get somewhat better. The cooperative movement has begun to take an interest in quality because of the uh, appellation of origins laws that have been applied to them now. And they're big enough to hire a good winemaker. So I would think that would be helpful. There are several thousand cooperative wineries in Italy. And then, of course, the Italians are very anxious to export to the northern European countries. And this will force them into appealing to the standards of the northern European countries, which are a good deal higher than the Italian standards. So that maybe just the export market alone will bring up the whole Italian uh, quality production. They have some of the problems that we have here too, though, however, large nationalism or regionalism, the desire to produce table wines in Sicily, for example, is a good example. Uh, the Sicilians consider themselves to be better than the rest of the Italians, and maybe they are at some things. Uh, <laughs> the Mafia, for example. But uh, they are intent on creating a table wine industry in Sicily uh, and they're spending a lot of time and energy in the little experiment station of Catania on this particular project. And maybe they will find some cooler areas, but it looks like a rather difficult sort of thing. Tuscany is the same way. The Tuscans could improve their winemaking procedures, but then the types would change somewhat. Uh, the San Giovetto for making uh, Chianti is not the best variety for making a red wine. And yet they're sort of stuck with it because of regional pride. They can't change. They've had San Giovetto for 500 years or more. And so they don't want to change from this variety to another variety. That's a real difficult problem. I promised that I would say some word about the governor process. Uh, we don't know how old this process was, but at least in the 19th century, there were already books and articles being written on it, pro and con. The process, briefly, is very simple. They make uh, most of the red wine perfectly normally, crush the grapes, uh, punch them down daily, or pump over in the modern times, and uh, press the wines at about one week. But about 10% of the total crop is not harvested. It's left on the vines, is later picked, and it's either stored on boxes, or in boxes, or it's uh, tied to strings. And then you take a long string and lay it on the floor and tie one cluster here, another cluster here, another cluster here, like that, and then pull them up to the top where they hang on to wires from the ceiling. I've seen rooms as big as this and bigger than this, absolutely packed with the grape clusters of this kind. They use, besides the San Giovetto for this purpose, they don't use too much of San Giovetto. The main variety they're using for this purpose is one they call Colorino. It has some other names, but that's the one we'll use here because it implies that it's giving color. It's a small, red, varied variety, which does have a lot of color. It's left then until Christmas or later, hanging up or stacked in boxes, one layer thick in boxes. And it, during this period, it dries, the grapes dry. Not completely dry, but they, they become much smaller than they were. Perhaps the sugar content goes up 30 40%. And then they are crushed and added back to the new wine that has already been fermented. So you're adding crushed, dried grapes at Christmas or in January back to grapes, uh, to wines that have already been made the previous fall in September, October. Uh, secondary fermentation takes place. The alcohol content goes up. Uh, the color goes up quite a bit because there's been a concentration of color. 
you get a little bit more alcohol than you would have guessed from the sugar content because these types of fermentations are quite efficient. There is a large yeast population there, so very little of the new reproduction of yeast is necessary. So they say they get a more efficient conversion of sugar uh, to alcohol. And uh, the wines, uh, uh, they claim, are governed. They're, that's why the word governo comes. They are governed according to, to make a new alcohol, a higher level of alcohol, and a higher level, level of color, and a higher flavor. Three things that happen in the governo process. And uh, these wines are quite appreciated. There are, however, some real problems. First of all, of course, it's an imitation to spoilage. Uh, you've got a uh, wine of 10 or 11 percent alcohol, and now you're adding more sugar in the middle of the winter and hoping that lactobacillus don't start and the yeast do start. And this is a real problem for them. Uh, quite frequently, they do not ferment dry. They stick with residual sugar. And then later, these wines will have a slow uh, fermentation during the spring and the following summer. And the wines are frizzanti, they're gassy. And this is quite appreciated in Italy. And there are many people like wines to be frizzanti. If it's, if, it's, if it's gassy and also has a pink foam on it, a schuma rosa, uh, then it's especially fine for many people in Italy. The gassy wine does not seem to bother them. Now, the gassiness can also come from malolactic fermentation. And then you not only get the gassiness, but you get a sauerkraut smell. And so, as between the two, I'm not sure that it's worth all the effort to, to do this sort of thing. If this is the, the only way of making wine in Chianti, then I would suggest that they make the wine separately, then combine them at some later time. Then they would know exactly what the, the um, amount of sugar was, and they could only add the, the governo part when it was dry, or essentially dry. But uh, that, this is the way it's developed. About one-third of Chianti's are made by the governo process. The other two-thirds are made by regular processes. And there's this continuing argument of whether it should be permitted or not. But traditionalists say it should be, and so it still is. The other uh, uh, production problem I'll mention just in passing is the extreme lack of interest in white wines. The Italian is most often interested in drinking red wines. And uh, the, the varietal problem here is even worse than it is with reds. Uh, you, you have to look hard or think hard to think of one good Italian white wine grape variety. Um, certainly it can't be Walsh Riesling, and certainly it can't be Trebbiano. Trebbiano is the one that we call Saint Gignon in the Cognac district, low acid variety, also sometimes called Uni Blanc, California and France. This is a very important variety, but very low in acid and no flavor. Uh, the Walsh Riesling, or the Italian Riesling, <coughs> has no very important flavor. It's widely used in Central Europe. Fair sugar acid balance, but not, nothing you could recognize. And the last one is a series of varieties, white varieties of low acid called Malvasia. They're not like the Malvasia down in the San Joaquin Valley, which is a muscat. These are non-muscat varieties, Malvasia, originally of Greek origin, and they're very low in acid again. So that they're the three most important varieties of Italy, white varieties, none of which are capable, even at their best, of producing high quality wine. All right, so much then for the Italian wine problem. It's um, sad, but um, I'm sorry to say it doesn't appear to be getting any better. Uh, every year I pray that we'll find some new wine to show you and say, see how good it is. Uh, if I had to live in Italy, and I don't think that would be a bad idea, I'd live up in the, near the Brenner Pass, near Bolzano and Mezzocorona in that area. Uh, where they have a lot of German influence, where the labels are quite frequently printed in German uh, script and so forth, and where they have some Merlot and Cabernet and Pinot Noir. But that's a very restricted area, only 20 miles long probably, and a few hundred acres altogether, maybe a thousand acres. Not a very big area. 
But if you like to ski and you, and you wanted to drink Italian wines and live in Italy, I think that'd be the place to, to go. <laughs> now, vermouth production developed in the late 18th century in Italy. The word vermouth, however, is of German origin, not of Italian origin. And was a, literally means a strong man or words to that effect. There are different ideas about how the word originated, but it really comes from uh, a German word. The, uh, there had been flavored wines before this. During the Middle Ages, there were lots of flavored wine. Various monasteries manufactured flavored wines. They had their own separate formulas. And at a later date, they began to distill, after distillation came in, in the 17th and 18th century, they began to distill some of these flavored wines. Hence the production of liqueurs like Benedictine uh, and, and Chartreuse and a great number of other uh, liqueurs that were produced from flavored wines which were then distilled. Now they don't make them that way anymore, but that was the original origin of almost all of our present day liqueurs. It was from wine plus herbs of various kinds, not only herbs but other plants and plant materials, which were allowed to to macerate together and then were then distilled and the volatile materials came over with the alcohol and then they were sweetened and they made uh, Benedictine and so forth. These became more complicated as time went on and the present formulas for Chartreuse and Benedictine, for example, are exceedingly complicated. Nobody has successfully imitated them, to be, to be correct about it. The main center of the air industry was Torino, which is in the northwestern corner of Italy in the old kingdom of Savoy. And the uh, type developed was largely a sweet wine and originally with a muscat base from white muscat, muscat blanc. The same variety that we call muscat canelli or muscat frontignan in California. And they call uh, muscata asti or uh, uh, various other names connected with Italy, but it all turns out to be Muscat Blanc. Early ripening, highly flavored Muscat variety with some tendency to raisin in the warmer years. And uh, to this wine was then added a variety of, of uh, plant materials, including uh, orange peel. Dried bitter orange peel and dried sweet orange peel, both were used. Uh, the other herbs were just the normal herbs of the region, uh, Mediterranean herbs of various kinds. But as herb prices went down in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, some more exotic materials began to be used. And I've given a list of some of those. Uh, chincona, which is the bark of the chincona tree from uh, Peru and uh, other South American countries from which quinine was obtained, began to be used as a method of giving a bitter taste to these flavored wines, and is still widely used for that purpose. The most important uh, flavored wine of France is uh, not vermouth, but is beer. Uh, red, sweet, bitter wine, to which chincona is still added to this day. Um, Vanilla was, uh, came from Madagascar largely. Uh, it's the uh, vanilla seed pod. It's an orchid, by the way. Uh, and uh, these gave uh, sweet wines particularly a uh, softer sort of smell, and if not used in too high amount, are still useful. Cinnamon was used uh, in small amounts. Cloves were used, nutmeg and mace were all used. Altogether, some uh, two or three hundred different plants or plant materials have been used in vermouth. Um, the um, the ma major source of them being Mediterranean uh, plant materials. Now, uh, the original method of making them was simply to take a gunny sack or a sack and put the herbs in the sack and throw the sack in the tank with a rock in it so it would sink to the bottom. And um, I guess that's the way it's still done in many, in many wineries. Uh, we visited a winery a few years ago, and they had a sack ready to put in a 10,000-gallon redwood tank. They were going to make their vermouth in the old-fashioned way of putting their own herbs in. Uh, but a good many wineries do not use that method anymore. And I've indicated the, uh, the other two processes that are used. There are really four of them. This is down under 2C. Um, 
putting the herbs in directly is sometimes used in the big tank, but more likely if you're going to have home production or own production, the one there would be that you did your own uh, extraction. So that one is divided into two parts, a sub A and a sub B. One is the herbs directly in it, and the other is to take a small lot of wine and make a very hot extraction of the herbs with that, and then use that to blend back into a much larger lot. So there are a lot of people who still buy herbs, and they, uh, they use them directly, or they use them to prepare uh, uh, an extract, which they then use for flavored wines. It's been recommended that a Solaris system be applied to the blending of these extracts so that the extracts would never run out. That is, you would make up a large lot, talk about Solaris a little bit later, but you're going to have it in bit three, take up a large lot of vermouth extract, we'll call this the original extract. And you need to draw off a small amount of it to, to make a uh, uh, tank of uh, vermouth, because this is a thousand gallon tank of the original extract. You take off 100 gallons and use it to flavor a lot of different uh, wines. Then you make up a new extract, as near as the last one as you can, and you add that to this. So that the extract now consists of 900 gallons of old extract and 100 gallons of new extract. And you leave this sit and ameliorate for a period of time, and then you would have, again take off 10%. Uh, 100 gallons for making a new blend. You would have left then at that time uh, 9,810 gallons of the original extract and 90 gallons of the new extract and you would have to put in another 100 gallons of a new, new extract. And so forth. And so that you never, it takes a long time to change the character of this. This is the basic idea of a solera. Here you have a vermouth solera. There are several wineries in California who've used this kind of a system. They've made up a large amount of extract, or in some cases have made up a large amount of vermouth, and then have taken off certain amounts of the vermouth, and then put in new vermouth. So that their formula, their flavor, didn't change over a long period of time. Uh, the process has a good many things to recommend it, but it does tie up a lot of money because you've got, instead of just making 100 gallons of uh, vermouth extract in this case, uh, you've got 900 gallons waiting in reserve to be used at some later time. So you've tied up uh, quite a lot of money and herbs and so forth and also space in the winery. So we don't feel that the Solara system will be used to a great extent in large wineries in California, except for things like keeping a standard solution of something standard all the time, or so that it changes very slowly over a long period of time. So it changes very... Now, most people, however, use the procedures two and three, both in this country and abroad. Uh, the process of extracting the flavors from different herbs and so forth can be industrialized better than it can be done locally. A whole plant can specialize on nothing but this. Uh, the use of hot wines, the use of steam, the use of alcohol, and so forth, distilling the residue and adding some of it back when it's desirable, um, so that we now have a large number of companies who buy from a supply house their dry and sweet uh, vermouth extract. And I'll show the Section 3 class this afternoon four of those, and the rest of you have already seen uh, four of them. There is uh, still another uh, method that's been used, um, uh, that is to buy one-third of your production from one company, another third from another company, and another third from another company. As I told you in the laboratory, one of the problems when you buy from somebody else is they might change their formula. By this method of not buying all of your formula from one company, you're hedging a little against, against the fact that the company might change the formula. And they wouldn't change your vermouth overnight. The other one, of course, would be to buy a large amount of the extract and use some sort of Solaris system of this kind here so that even if they did change their formula, it would only change the composition and the character of your vermouth over a fairly long period of time, might be four or five years before there'd be any noticeable difference in it. Well, there are some very real um, uh, vermouth um, uh, problems, and uh, I want to talk about some of those present time. Some of them are not there, and I'll add them to it. The first one, of course, is in getting uh, herbs in good condition. And this is uh, not as easy as it might sound. 
uh, finding herbs in, um, in uh, good condition. It depends on keeping them very dry and keeping them free of insect infestation. Those of you who looked at those herb boxes that went around should have seen the, the borers that had gotten, gotten right through the cardboard walls of one of the herbs that we passed around in class. Uh, little tiny round uh, borers had gone right through them, trying to get at the flavor material inside to which they were attracted. Uh, right during the latter part of the war, when all the herb extracts of the country were being combed for, uh, to, to supply the need for the vermouth industry, there was a lot of very poor herbs that got into the channels of trade. And when I came back after the war, well, I was really rather sad to see some of the vermouths that were being produced from these bad herb mixtures. Uh, if you do buy your own herbs, you should put them in airtight containers, five gallon uh, uh, containers or 50 gallon containers, uh, and uh, kept dry at uh, a rather cool temperature. Uh, this is the only way I know. Second is the herbs get too old. They, uh, they lose their flavor with time. Uh, anise, the anise that I passed around in class, has very little anise left in it. It wouldn't make hardly any quality of anisette or any anise liqueur that you might make from it because we've had it around for several years and since we don't make vermouths anymore uh, here, why uh, would it has uh, not um, um, been replaced and it should be replaced. There are um, reports in the literature that some herbs should not be uh, kept around other herbs, that they have uh, some bad effects on each other. I've not been able to prove that to my satisfaction. Um, and it doesn't look like an easy problem to solve. The next problem in vermouth production is securing a formula. In the dessert wine book, there are, I think, 19 dry vermouth formulas and seven sweet vermouth formulas. Uh, none of them produce perfect vermouths. They vary over quite a wide range. Uh, some students who have used them have combined two or three of the formulas in order to make the, their own um, uh, uh, formula. Uh, of course, if you're buying your extract, the formula is not a problem. You simply shop around until you find an extract that you like. But if you're making it yourself, why well, then you've got to pick the herbs yourself. And that becomes a fair amount of problem. The herbs do vary in quality from year to year. So there are such things as vintage years in vanilla and vintage years in, um, in wormwood or artemisia and uh, quite big variations so that one lot may be perfectly authentic and fresh and properly dried and properly stored and only have a half as much uh, herb character as another. So when putting these together at, in a plant, the formula may work one time and the next time from the same herbs but a different lot of the same herbs the formula will not work as well. So most people who are manufacturing their own vermouth run some sort of Solera system to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Uh, if one ingredient is low, by using a Solera system of this kind, uh, they can even out the change from, and b besides the next slot of vermouth that they make may be high in that quality again. They won't all be low in one year and all high in another year. The next problem is how long to leave them in contact with the herbs. And this was a very big problem that's, again, not easily solved. The herbs vary in their tannin content, just like grapes do, from a cold year to a hot year, in exactly the same way. In hot years, there's less tannin, or polyphenolic compounds, and in cool years, there is more, just as there's more color in uh, cool locations in California than there is in warm locations in California. Now, in some cases, you want a bitter flavor in the vermouth, particularly in dry vermouths, a little bitter flavor seems to be desirable. But in many cases where the tannin content of the herbs is in a cool year, if you leave them for four days, which is your normal time, it may be twice too long. They may extract too much bitter material. So that if you're doing the extraction, you practically have to house mate it through, that is you have to watch it on a day-to-day -day basis and taste it against what you want and against what you've already gotten. And it may turn out that the last time you made it with the herbs, uh, it took uh, one week of maceration to get the desired flavor. Uh, this time it may be completed in three days or it may not be completed for two weeks or even three weeks. And so you can't set down any hard and fast rules. 
although generally uh, most people are leaving it around one week to two weeks. Although we visited a winery down at Lodi a few years ago that was leaving it in 30 days, which is about as long as any of I've heard in California. In small lots in the laboratory and so forth, if you do this, why sometimes 24 hours will give you a big enough extraction, uh, surface to volume relationship being such as it is. The next problem is the clarification. Uh, if you think you've ever had problems in a winery in clarifying a Chardonnay or a white wine, you haven't seen any problems until it comes to uh, clarifying vermouths. Uh, vermouths can be very recalcitrant. They say in the wineries they're dirty dogs. Uh, they, um, they'll clarify just beautiful one time. The next time they'll, uh, they'll clarify, they'll look beautiful, and you chill them, and they'll go cloudy and stay cloudy. Uh, the next time they'll filter brilliantly, you heat them up, they'll go cloudy, and they'll stay cloudy. Uh, and uh, this apparently has to do with the extraction of various kind of colloidal material from the various herbs and uh, that they are not heat stable or they're not cold stable in many cases. So generally speaking, the people who make their own vermouths uh, have to do both cold stabilization and hot stabilization in order to get the wines clarified. However, when you're using extracts, that's not so. In using extracts, the amount of extract is very small, and there's no contact with anything except what's alcohol soluble. The extract is an alcoholic solution of the herb material. It can be clarified as extract, so you're usually adding a fairly clear material, a uh, small amount of it, to a large volume of wine. And so it's much easier to clarify wines <coughs> to which you add extracts than it is to clarify wines which have had the herbs in direct contact with the wine. Uh, the pasteurization is usually done at moderate temperatures, around 160 to 170 Fahrenheit, for fairly short periods of time, followed by close filtration, and uh, that will take care of the heat stabilization process. The cold uh, sterilization is usually done at the same time as tartrate precipitation, and stabilizing the wine for tartrate precipitation, uh, the herb is added before the tartrate stabilization, and the, as it clarifies, the cold Sta unstable material will precipitate out and come down with the tartrates. And the tartrates may help this uh, clarification process itself. It's absolutely necessary to close filter vermouths, whether you make them from extract or whether you make them directly. And it's absolutely necessary that you make both hot and cold uh, aging tests on them before they're distributed. And Professor Burke will have a special laboratory on that subject next quarter, so I won't go into any further detail about testing for clarification. The problem of the darkening of the white type has been uh, with us for a long time. Um, uh, Dawson Wright down at Gallup published a paper some 15 years ago on this subject, uh, recommending the use of SO2 as one method for preventing this, but admitting that this is a very dangerous solution because by adding SO2, you cut down on some of the vermouth flavor. Uh, the SO2 reacts with some of the vermouth character, odors, and the ver it also has its own smell, which detracts from the vermouth smell. So that uh, you have to add SO2, the amounts that Mr. Wright recommended in the range of 100 to 125 do not seem to be terribly dangerous, but uh, even so, we must recognize that it, it doesn't improve the quality. It may prevent the dry vermouths from darkening. The other method of keeping them very light, of course, has been the use of charcoal. And since the demand is for very, very light colored uh, vermouths, this is a very attractive sort of, uh, of a solution, except that there are legal limits on the amount of charcoal that can be used. Um, some of you uh, remember that you used to uh, chew um, a chewing gum that was black. And uh, that, of course, has now been disapproved because charcoal is supposed to have carcinogenic agents in it. And so the use of charcoal is strictly limited by law in this country. So in order to get materials that are light enough, the vermouth people now are using specially prepared white wines. The white wines are separated. Only the free-run juice is used. In the San Joaquin Valley, where they're using Thompson's for this purpose, only the free-run juice, and there's absolutely no fermentation allowed to take place on the skin. So they're trying to... to do, get a white wine that's as light as possible in color. It's 
In many cases, they try and keep it out of contact of the air, keep it under SO2 the entire time, and uh, produce a wine as light as possible. The bitterness problem has uh, not been published on, but everybody's aware of the bitterness problem. And uh, polyvinyl polyvinyl pyrrolidone uh, is being used. PVP or PVPP have been used for this purpose in California. Uh, it's better than gelatin, which was the old method of trying to reduce the bitter principle and seems to work reasonably well in most cases. We've had a few complaints about bitterness uh, in um, dry vermouths, but in general, at 4% sugar, the bitter taste is uh, largely subdued, and so that you don't have to worry about the bitter taste uh, in dry vermouths too often, although once in a while you'll find one that does have too much bitter taste. Maybe a little bitter taste is all right. I'm not saying it's bad, but you don't want it to come out and hit you in the nose. In the sweet type, the, the vanilla and peppermint smells and the orange smells sometimes get out of hand. The ideal formula or the ideal extract is one where you have difficult identifying individual characteristics, that no one of them tends to predominate. That if you can identify them, they're all a part of, of a balanced uh, herb, herb character. But where one of them predominates all the others and tends to subdue all the others, it makes it much less interesting doesn't make for a complex vermouth character. And finally, there's the lack of vermouth character in many wines. They've, they've reduced the amount of extract or reduced the amount of herbs so that in some cases, you really have to think, am I drinking vermouth or am I not drinking vermouth? Uh, it's down that low in some cases. This, of course, reflects, as I said in the laboratory, the fact that dry vermouths, at least, are used almost exclusively in this country for the making of the martini cocktail. And uh, since wine is still cheaper than gin, the idea of using a large amount of wine, cheap, and making the customer think he's getting gin, expensive, is very good economics for the bartender. Uh, you ask for a four to one martini, but he gives you a two to one or a one to one, and you don't know the difference because it's the same color, and there's so little vermouth character in it that you can't tell whether it has any flavor or not. Most people are not looking for the gin character, and many people are using vodka for making the martini cocktail, not gin at all. So the more neutral it is, the less herb character it has, the more wine they can use, and uh, the more neutral it is, of course, the, the better uh, vodka martini uh, the customer thinks he's getting, because it doesn't have any winey character or herb character. Um, this is cheating, of course, on the customer, and I, but the industry has gone along with it, so that there is not a single dry vermouth being produced in California at the present time that is not very light in color. In fact, they brag about how light the color is on them. If you look in the trade journals and so forth, they'll say X brand vermouth is ultra light in color and so forth. The bartenders know exactly why it is that way. Well, um, I, people have asked me how I would change the situation. I don't know that there's any way it can be changed. That's what the de public demands, and I think that's what the public is going to get. I do think that we could produce a, a medium sweet vermouth with the sweet vermouth character that might have some sale in its own right. And there are a fair number of people now who will ask for a half and half, half dry vermouth and half sweet vermouth. This, uh, if, you want, if you like herb character, if you like flavored character, uh, this makes a not too sweet a drink, although it's fairly sweet. Uh, served over ice and so forth, it makes a, a wine cocktail of, of fair quality. Uh, we're a little early, but you can look at your quiz paper. I want to see Mr. Nino, Neil, Nino, Ron Nino. The A's on my right, and then the C's, F's. 